people in the town that I followed, watched. For three decades, Dennis Rader played hide and seek with his own demons and Wichita cops. In the process, he held an entire community hostage. It said, to the news team, thank you for getting the message out. And then it said, P.S., sorry about Susan's and Jeff's cold. Really creepy. Really spooked us out. Raider was finally caught in early 2005. His arrest shocked everyone. He was the guy next door. He was going to our church. He was shopping with us. He was one of us. How could that be? Raider is part of a frightening fraternity that includes Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, and Jeffrey Dahmer, shown here in a deposition never before seen on TV. I uh, injected another syringe full of that uh, dull hydrochloric acid. If you eat their flesh, you cannibalize them? Hey, it doesn't get crazier than that. So why do seemingly normal people turn evil? And what triggers this descent into madness? To answer those questions, we talk with the experts, including psychologists. I guess I'd call it joy of being a serial killer is to know that you can do it without emotional consequences. And these guys, I think, get a real kick out of it. And former FBI profilers. There may be a genetic predisposition to violence, and they're brought up in an abusive environment, then we're almost guaranteed to create a monster. We also give voice to those least often heard. My family was killed, and uh, I found them all dead in the most horrible way. But I do remember telling Tim if anybody approached him to drop everything he had and run and scream. And in an exclusive interview, best-selling author Patricia Cornwell unmasks the most infamous serial killer of all time. He was not a legendary figure in the fog with a top hat. He was a violent, horrible man. And if you look at what he did to Mary Kelly, it is probably the most grotesque crime scene I have ever seen. They are elusive, unpredictable, heartless and they're nearly impossible to stop. True Hollywood Story investigates inside the mind of a serial killer. The man accused of being the serial killer known as BTK lived in this house behind me with his wife and two children for more than 20 years. Yet Dennis Rader seemed no different from any other neighbor in this quiet community. He was not really outgoing, but he was friendly. He never said a bad word to him. I mean, if we meet three or four nights, we'd out in the street, we'd talk about the weather. Never, ever would I suspect, you know, that he was even wanted on a traffic stop. I think most people want to expect that a murderer is going to be the guy that's foaming from the mouth. Well, when you look at a picture of Ted Bundy, and he could be your attorney, and uh, that upsets people, because they want to protect themselves. You don't want to run into a guy like that. Unfortunately, you can't tell. We want serial killers to be like Charlie Manson, to have a wild-eyed look and a swastika tattooed in the center of their forehead. And we'd like to know them when we see them, and we get uncomfortable when, when we have someone who is a successful businessman and married and seemingly normal, but it's the mask of sanity. Underneath this, they have a second alternate life that uh, they're leading that is very pathological, but is for them the most rewarding. IDing these guys is a challenge, and authorities believe that more than 200 unsolved murders around the country are the work of serial killers. They hide in plain sight. They are chameleons who fit in so well that people who are looking for this cruel, sadistic killer aren't thinking that the guy who's a deacon would be a killer like that. Two to four percent of the population probably are, uh, you know, have some recognizable psychopathic traits. So they're out there. When we look at these banks of missing people, there are thousands of them listed. And where did they all go? And why don't they turn up? And my feeling is that some of them, and nobody knows how many, but are simply are victims of serial killers. They have been taken off, uh, murdered, and are buried someplace by somebody who is working very efficiently. Serial killers are not necessarily stupid people. So that when you look at a picture on a milk carton, uh, that person may very well be dead, not just missing. Getting away with murder wasn't enough for monsters like BTK. He hungered for more. 
all that taunting and flaunting and letters and, and sending uh, photos of the crime scenes and sending victims uh, uh, driver's licenses and ID and the stuff that he did was all about taunting authorities. He wanted to prove that he was smarter. I guess I caught joy of being a serial killer is to know that you can do it without emotional consequences. And these guys, I think, get a real kick out of it. They kill initially for the thrill, like taking a drug for the first time. And they get a high. And then maybe they'll do it again a year later. But it takes more and more of the substance, which is murder, to make them feel normal. Dahmer became infamous in the early 1990s, but serial killers have stoked the public's fear and imagination for centuries. Serial murder has been with us as long as uh, we've had mankind. I, I think that it uh, uh, wasn't recognized for what it was early on. I think if you go back to the medieval times, they would find someone horribly murdered, mutilated, and that gave rise to myths of werewolves and vampires and monsters that came out in the night to do this. Those cases were probably serial murder uh, cases that were going on, just not recognized for what it was. Serial killers are the closest personification we have to evil because we can't figure out why they're doing what they're doing. There's a long history of this kind of thing in folk tales like the Grimm's fairy tales where you had the old witch in the wood who would uh, lure in little children and, and cook them. So that this kind of story goes way back into history. I think people are fascinated by them. There is something that is that is completely mind-boggling, I think, about unadulterated evil. In some sense, it frightens us as human beings that another human being can do something so intrinsically bad. Some identify with these serial killers for the long, wrong reasons. Uh, they might like to do it, but they just don't really dare to do it, and they live sort of vicariously. You have guys like Vlad the Impaler, who was the original Dracula, uh, who killed hundreds of people. Now, he did a sort of out in public because he was the prince of the Transylvanian principality and so he wasn't being secretive about it but he nevertheless seemed to take the same kind of delight that a serial killer takes from killing the same sense of power the sense of control that these guys get and so this was you know hundreds of years ago what was once the stuff of fairy tales and nightmares came to life in the movies Hollywood is fascinated with serial killers because normal people are fascinated with serial killers. But we have a fascination with monsters. We always have. We have a fascination with darkness as humans. And uh, we, these evil folk, uh, ask ourselves, how do they get to be this way? Is there something in them that's in me? Maybe the most talked about serial killer in history is Jack the Ripper. More than a hundred years after committing a string of horrific murders in London, the Ripper lives on in books and films. He was not a legendary figure in the fog with a top hat. He was a violent, horrible man. And if you look at what he did to Mary Kelly, it is probably the most grotesque crime scene I have ever seen. I mean, he, he, he brutalized that woman to a point of it's worse than something that you would see in a, in a horror show. And it's unbelievable, the violence there. There is nothing glamorous or mythical about it. It's horrible. Best-selling author Patricia Cornwell spent years searching for the true identity of Jack the Ripper. We are always intrigued by something that seems to have no answer. Um, and also, a case takes on a life of its own when there's been enough publicity about it. And the Jack the Ripper mystique has built and built and built over the decades. If you look at it for what it was, it's really not so different than crimes we read about in the paper today. I mean, if somebody was um, doing blitz attacks on prostitutes in a very poor area of town, it's just that the way he did it is very flamboyant, but the deaths of these women is not very different. I mean, look at the BTK killer. Um, what, you know, he could just as easily have been Jack the Ripper. Cornwall uncovers evidence she says solves that mystery. We'll have more on her findings later. But first, a look at one of the longest running and most shocking serial murder cases in FBI history when THSI returns. I smelled the death, the fear, uh, those smells and those senses have never left me. It said whiting the letters while he was communicating with the media. He wanted publicity.
Welcome back to THS Investigates. In this house behind me, the serial killer known as BTK began his 30-year reign of terror in Wichita, Kansas. In 1974, the killer brutally murdered a family of four within these walls. The case shows how elusive these killers can be and how they can easily hide in plain sight. That's exactly what Dennis Rader did for three decades. But in late February 2005, Rader's luck ran out. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today is a very historic day. Bottom line, BTK is arrested. He's been going to the grocery store with us. He's been going to church with us. He's been sitting beside us in the movie theater. It was confusing. I, it did not make any sense. Not for the Dennis Rader that I know that sat in this pew in church. I thought I knew this guy for over a year and you just don't know people. The long nightmare in Wichita began late in the afternoon of January 15th, 1974. Charlie Otero, who was 15 at the time, came home from school that day to a horrible scene. My world was turned upside down, my family was killed, and uh, I found them all. I smelled the death, the fear, uh, those smells and those senses have never left me. Um, I can sense fear from a block away. They were all strangled and bound with the parents. Uh, she was found on the bed, strangled by the neck and gagged. She was gagged. Uh, the father was on the floor in a similar position. He had also been strangled. The little boy was in his bedroom, fully clothed, but he had three plastic bags over his head, plus duct tape around his neck. In June 2005, four months after his arrest, Dennis Rader confessed to killing Joseph and Julie Otero and their two children. Rader described the murders to the judge in graphic detail. Uh, they started complaining about uh, being tied up, and I re-loosened re the bonds a couple of times, uh, tried to make Mr. Otero as comfortable as I could. Uh, apparently he had a cracked rib from a car accident. So I had him put a pillow down on for his head. I didn't have a mask on or anything. They already could ID me and uh, uh, made, a, made a decision to go ahead and, and uh, put him down. First of all, Mr. Otero was strangled, or a bag put over his head and strangled. Then I thought he was going down, and I went over and strangled Mrs. Otero, and I thought she was down. Then I strangled uh, uh, Josephine, uh, she was down, and then I went over to Junior and put the bag on his head. After that, Mrs. Otero woke back up, and uh, you know she was pretty upset. What's going on? So I came back, and uh, at that point in time, strangled her uh, for for the death strangle. At that time, what did you do then? And I took her to the basement and eventually uh, hung her. Are you hung her in the basement? Yes, sir. A family of four murdered in a ritual-style killing. That had never happened in the Wichita area before. It just didn't happen in Wichita, Kansas. It didn't happen out here on the plains of Kansas. A ritual serial killing was something that happened on the East Coast or on the West Coast of New York or L.A., but certainly not in the heartland. So the Otero murder was the first time that we knew we had a crazy person out there. Police were baffled. The community stunned. Why would anyone want to kill an all-American family like the Oteros? My father was a Air Force sergeant, um, career man. My mom was a homemaker, first and foremost. Her job and her place in life was to take care of us. And uh, she loved it, as far as I knew, and she did a good job. My little brother and my little sister were like the stars of the family. It really pains me to think that they didn't get the opportunities that they so richly deserve to live life as God has allowed us to um, have here on earth. And uh, that's the burn I get, really, that they didn't get the chance. In early April 1974, Raider struck again. The victims, 20-year-old Catherine Bright and her younger brother, Kevin. I have many what I call them projects. They were different people in the town that I followed, watched. Uh, Kathleen Bright was one of the next targets, I guess, as I would indicate. 
how did you select her? Uh, just driving by one day and I saw her go in the house with somebody else and I thought that's a possibility. I broke into the house and waited for her to come home. She and uh, Kevin uh, Bright came in. Uh, I wasn't expecting him to be there. I think I had him tie her up first and then I tied him up. Basically I moved her to another bedroom and he was already secure there by the bed. Uh, tied his feet to the uh, bedpost, while the bedpost so he couldn't run. Uh, kind of tied her in the other bedroom and then I came back to strangle him. And at that time we had a fight. When I started strangling, the, either the uh, parent broke or he broke his bonds and he jumped up real quick like. I pulled my gun and quickly shot him, hit him in the head. He fell over. Uh, I could see the blood, and as far as I concerned, he, you know, I thought he was down. Went back to uh, finish the job on Catherine, and uh, she was fighting. And at, at that point in time, I'd been fighting her. The strangulation wasn't working on her, and I uh, used a knife on her. You say you used a knife on yeah. her. Yes. What did you do with the knife? I stabbed her. I think she said either stabbed two or three times, uh, either here or here. Maybe two back here and one here, or maybe just two times back now here. You were pointing to your lower back and your, your... Yeah, underneath the ribs. And your lower abdomen. Yeah, underneath the ribs. I heard him escape. It could be one of the two. But all of a sudden, the front door of the house was open and he was gone. And, uh, or, oh, i tell you what I thought. I thought the police were coming at that time. I heard the door open. I thought, no, that's it. And I stepped out there and he, I could see him running down the street. So I quickly cleaned up everything that I could and left. Kevin went for help, called police, and gave a description of his sister's killer to a sketch artist. At the time, Kathy Bright was not tied into or connected in any way to the Otero murder. There were some similarities, but the investigators at the time still were not thinking serial killer type person. No one connected the police sketch to Dennis Rader. Then, in late 1974, an anonymous call tipped off reporters to a letter hidden inside the public library. The Wichita Sun printed parts of the letter on December 11th. It said everything. It said the reason why he was killing. It said why he was writing the letters, why he was communicating with the media. He wanted publicity. What authorities didn't know was the letter came from Dennis Rader. He signed his letters BTK. Short for his M.O., bind, torture, kill. Raider told the cops there would be more victims. And then is when we became involved with the FBI, asked them for assistance and with other profilers in the area of uh, serial killers as to who might help us put some kind of an identity together for, uh, for identifying this to determine whether or not is he going to do it again, what would trigger him. The case was assigned to the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, formed just two years earlier in Quantico, Virginia. The FBI was the first uh, law enforcement agency to organize a unit and to, to, to take an organized and methodical approach to, um, to doing this. There are individual cases. If you go back to Jack the Ripper, for example, there was a profile down of Jack the Ripper at the time by a physician, and he described certain characteristics and traits of the killer. But as far as an organizational approach to this, I think the FBI began that. Both FBI agents and Wichita detectives hoped BTK would make a mistake. Any mistake. But that's about all they agreed on. We were being told all along that the type of the individual we're looking for is a loner. This is a person that will not fit in. This is a person that will go from job to job. This is a person that cannot maintain any kind of a relationship for any length of time. But we just came with kept coming back to the fact that we didn't think that was right. At the very early stages of uh, profiling, when we were just really taking a stab at, uh, stab at doing this, it was obvious this is a sexually sadistic offender. In March 1977, nearly three years after murdering Catherine Bright, Raider killed again. I met a, a young boy <laughs> and uh, asked him if he ID some pictures. Uh, kind of as a rust, I guess, or roost, as you call it, and uh, kind of feel it out. And uh, saw where he went, knocked on the door, and told him I was a private detective. And at that time, I, I had the gun here, and I just kind of forced myself in. I just you know, walked in, just opened the door, walked in, and then 
bullet pistol. The boy's mother, 26-year-old Shirley Vianne, was homesick that day. I told uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Vianne that uh, I had a problem with uh, sexual fantasies. And I proceeded to tie the kids up. And they started crying and got real upset. So I said, oh, this is not going to work. So we moved them to the bathroom. She helped me. We uh, tied one of the bathroom doors shut so they couldn't open it. And we shoved. she went back and helped me shove the bed up against the other bathroom door. And then I proceeded to uh, tie her up. Uh, she got sick, threw up, um, got her a glass of water, comforted her a little bit, and then I went ahead and tied her up and then uh, put a bag, a bag over her head and strangled her. Nine months later, 25-year-old Nancy Fox became Raider's next victim. She was uh, spotted, and then I did a little homework. I dropped by once to check the mailbox to see what her name was, and then I just selected a night which was this particular night to try it, and it worked out. Uh, I confronted her, uh, told her there I was a, uh, had a problem, sexual problem, that I would have to tie her up and have sex with her. Uh, she was uh, a little upset. Uh, we talked for a while. Uh, she smoked a cigarette. She finally said, uh, well, let's get this over with so I can go call the police. And I said, okay. And she said, can I go to the bathroom? And I said, yes. Uh, she went to the bathroom and came, and I told her when she came out to make sure that she was undressed. I handcuffed her, had her lay on the bed, and then I tied her feet, and uh, then I, I, I was also undressed to a certain degree, and then I got on top of her, and then I reached over, took either either her feet were tied or not tied, but anyway, I, took, I think I had a belt. I took the belt and then strangled her with a belt at that time. This time, Raider reported the crime himself. Frantic? Yes, you will find a homicide at 843 South Pershing. Nancy Fox. I'm sorry, sir, I can't understand you. What is the address? 843 South Pershing. That is correct. When the officers arrived at that scene, no one had been there. She was on the bed, face down, bound, gagged. Uh, there was the negligee laying by, by her head where he had masturbated into it and laid the semen there by her head. She was laying down, her buttocks was pulled up, her panties were down between her uh, knees and her thighs. By early 1978, the serial killer who called himself BTK had all of Wichita in a panic. The fear was justified. The man who committed seven brutal murders over four years lived and worked right in the community. 32-year-old Dennis Rader had a wife and two small children. That was part of his psyche while leading his other life of being a family man uh, in, a, in a very disturbing dichotomy of serial killer uh, by night and family man by day. Raider shifted back to his other life as BTK just one month after killing 25-year-old Nancy Fox. Then on January 31st of that year, Dennis Raider mocked police again by sending a letter to the Wichita Eagle. Inside, a chilling poem about victim number six, Shirley Vianne. What is this that I can see? Cold, icy hands take hold of me. For death has come, you all can see. Hell had opened its gates to trick me. But he certainly was not satisfied with merely murdering. He wasn't satisfied with merely causing pain in people's lives. He wanted some notoriety for it. Some serial killers want the infamy of what they're doing known. They want to terrorize the community uh, as well as, as their victims. And this certainly was what BTK was about. And it's fueled by the narcissism, which is um, his need to be important, to believe and, and to him to reinforce that he's smarter than everybody else. He's outsmarting the police, terrorizing the community, and this is all very heady, very intoxicating stuff. It turned out the letter was postmarked nine days earlier and mistaken for a valentine. The letter had been missent and ended up in their mail room in the wrong place, and they didn't know they had it, so the Eagle didn't publish any story about it. Raider soon followed up with another letter, this time to Cake TV. He said, quote, how many more people do I have to kill before I get my name in the paper? He said, I have something called Factor X. And you don't understand why I kill because you don't have Factor X. Factor X is something that makes me kill. 
and it's in a lot of us. Then in April 1979, 63-year-old Anna Williams received a frightening letter. There was a poem enclosed entitled, Oh Anna, Why Didn't You Appear? Police believe the poet was BTK and that he intended to kill Williams but never followed through. After that, the letters suddenly stopped. I think that, that the community started to, to not drop their guard, but to seriously question, where, where is this person? And the speculation kept everyone still wondering, where is he? Is he in jail? Is he gone from our community? Is he maybe in a mental institution? Uh, where could this person be? Because surely he just hasn't gone away and, and left. They had his voice on tape, but you know, his voice sounded like a lot of people. Uh, the technology it wasn't as sophisticated back in the 70s as it is today, where they could start to isolate different frequencies and look at backgrounds and all of those things. Life in Wichita slowly returned to normal. The BTK case remained open, but the trail went cold. Six years passed. Then in May 1985, Raider again took on his BTK persona. He later explained in court why he waited so long to kill for the eighth time. If you read much about serial killers, they go through what they call the different phases. Uh, that's one of the phases they go through as a, a, as a trolling stage. You're basically, you're looking for a victim at that time. And that, you could be trolling for months or years. But once you lock in on a certain person, then you become a stalking. And that might be several of them, but you really home in on that person. Uh, they, they basically become the, that's, that's the victim. This time, the victim was 53-year-old Maureen Hedge. She was murdered in Park City, a few miles north of Wichita. Hedge lived only a couple of doors down from Dennis Rader. Since she lived down the street from me, I could watch the coming and going quite easily. And after checking the house, she wasn't there. So I went, went back to one of the bedrooms and hid back there in one of the bedrooms. Uh, she came in with a male visitor. They were there for maybe an hour or so. Uh, he left, I waited till wee hours in the morning. Uh, and then proceeded to uh, sneak into her bedroom and uh, put the lights on, the like, or I think the bathroom lights. I just I didn't want to flip her lights on, and, and she screamed, and I jumped on the bed and strangled her manually. What Raider said he did next is hard to even imagine. I uh, went ahead and uh, stripped her. I put her on a blanket, uh, went through her purse, eventually uh, moved her to the trunk of the car, took the car over to uh, Christ Lutheran Church. Uh, this is with the older church and uh, I took some pictures of her. She was already dead, so I took uh, pictures of her in different forms of bondage. Raider knew the church well. He was the president of the congregation. Raider says he then dumped Hedge's body in a ditch. A year later, 28-year-old Vicki Weggerly answered a knock on her door. The man said he worked for the telephone company. In fact, it was Dennis Raider. I told her I was gonna have to tie her up. Uh, she was very upset, and I think we I used some material that was in, uh, and that, that's another thing, I'm not sure, but I, I think I used some material that they had in their bedroom, and after I tied her hands, uh, she broke that and we started fighting. And we fought quite a bit, back and forth. All right, she was physically fighting you? Oh yeah, yes sir. Mm -hmm. What happened then? I uh, finally got the hand on her, and got a, uh, a nylon sock and started strangling. Again, the investigation hit a dead end. Five more years passed. Then, in 1991, 62-year-old Dolores Davis became victim number 10. In court, Dennis Rader said he broke into Davis's home. He told her he was a wanted man on the run who needed some food and transportation. We went back and checked out where the car was, uh, simulated getting some food, odds and ends in the house that I was leaving. Then went back and uh, removed her handcuffs and, uh, and then tied her up and then, and then eventually strangled her. The body of Dolores Davis was found under a bridge 12 days later. Police still had no suspects. The hunt intensified. Though it would be 13 years before Dennis Rader, the serial killer, surfaced again. Everybody thought that BTK was a dead case. Everybody thought it, that he had either been arrested 
uh, and incarcerated or that he had died. So everybody kind of forgot about BTK until 2004 when he started communicating again. And then he began terrorizing a whole new generation of Wichitans. On March 17, 2004, a letter arrived at the offices of the Wichita Eagle. This one contained a photocopy of Vicki Weggerly's driver's license and photos from the scene of her murder back in 1991. We knew he had a whole inventory of items that he had taken from the various crime scenes and that the probability is he was holding on to those. We knew he was taking pictures at the crime scene. Two months later, another letter. This one addressed to TV station KAKE. It included a cryptic message. Look at the words that are found in that puzzle. The words like cruise, sex, build up, steam, go for it. And then he talks about his M.O. You know, fake ID. Most chilling of all, what appeared to be the outline for a book. The BTK story, a serial killer is born, dawn, fetish, fantasy world, the search begins, BTK haunts PG. And it went through the chapters 1 through 13. Seemed like he was referring to a killing that was a part of another chapter. First of all, we didn't believe it was BTK because it had been so long. And I think the police department and the FBI were very skeptical that this guy could be BTK. But obviously he began enclosing information that only BTK would know about, including items from the victims, pictures that only BTK would have taken. And then everybody was just really taken back. My God, the story has started up again. Here we go again down this same path. How could this be? He started giving us trophies back which was totally contrary. Here he'd saved these things for, what, 25 years plus, and now he started leaving them out. Not only did he give them back, but he left them out in such an area uh, of town where they could have literally been picked up and thrown away. I mean, someone could have walked right past them. Over the next few months, the letters and packages kept coming. They were left at drop points or sent to the media. Every time we got a letter, we'd give it to the police department, but we'd also do several stories on it, he'd respond again. We'd get a letter, the police department would respond to the letter, have a news conference, then he'd respond again. In December 2004, a suspicious looking plastic bag turned up in a Wichita park. Cops found a driver's license belonging to Nancy Fox, victim number seven. The bag also contained a hooded Barbie doll. The feet were tied together with pantyhose. In the beginning, he was trying to figure out his identity, who he was. Now, I think this last time, he was trying to tell his story. He's trying to tell us who he was. In January 2005, Raider upped the ante. He sent a postcard to Cake TV with a very personal message. And then it said, to the news team, thank you for getting the message out. And then it said, P.S., sorry about Susan's and Jeff's cold. My co-anchor and I had colds. And we referred to our colds on the air. Really creepy. Really spooked us out. When you compare the first communications to this last year's communication, you'll see a definite change in his tone. The first communications were full of anger. They were full of rage. He just almost wanted to reach out and hit you through his communications. And the later communications, the ones that we started receiving here in the last year or so, there was a tone change. He had a, he had a pattern in mind. That February, another TV station, KSAS, received what was called the 11th communication from BTK. But this time, he made a serious mistake. Coming up... And of course, the technology with the, with the disc and, and all the stuff that, that came out, they were able to narrow it down pretty quick. decade of silence, the murderer who called himself BTK suddenly resurfaced. Beginning in March 2004, he sent a series of letters to media outlets in Wichita. Then on February 16, 2005, 
a computer disc arrived here at local TV station KSAS. The station reported receiving the disc that day, but gave no more details at the request of police. It was the break cops had been looking for. The disc had been sent to uh, the Fox station in a manila folder, and it they, they photographed it, and then they turned it over to law enforcement. And on that disc was sufficient information to be able to hone in on who the suspect might be. With the sophistication of, of uh, computer software and all that stuff, they're able to plug in a lot of information uh, at the same time. And of course the technology with the, with the disc and, and all the stuff that, that came out, they were able to narrow it down pretty quick. The source of the disc? A computer at Christ Lutheran Church in Wichita. On February 25th, police arrested 59-year-old Dennis Rader, the head of the church council. There was no basis to believe that there was any accomplice, that there was anybody else involved, and that Dennis Rader was BTK. And upon his arrest, it became as crystal clear as it could be that Dennis Rader was BTK. Before his arrest, detectives subpoenaed the medical records of Raider's 26-year-old daughter. Those records contained a tissue sample that matched the DNA of her father, obtained from one of the crime scenes. After arresting Raider, police paid a visit to Reverend Michael Clark at Christ Lutheran Church. It was a day Clark will never forget. I was just getting ready to go to lunch, and I just happened to see these four officers coming to the door, and I didn't even know who they were until I went to the door and I opened up and I saw a badge hanging from Lieutenant Bridges belt and that's when I knew that it was somebody from the police department and he and three other detectives came in and he presented to come down here to my office and then uh, present the search warrant to me and explain why he was here detectives told Reverend Clark they believed they had their man I mean it was confusing I it did not make any sense not for the Dennis Rader that I know, that sat in this pew in church, was my council president at the time, and has done a lot here since just in the four years that I've been here. Rader's arrest sent shockwaves throughout the state and across the country. He was the guy next door. He was going to our church. He was shopping with us. He was one of us. How could that be? You know, when they said when he was caught, it could be your coworker, it could be your friend, it could be your neighbor. I'm thinking, yeah, all right. I thought I knew this guy for over a year. I, and you just don't know people until, you know, you just don't know. He was a member of the community, but he faked his membership in the community. Because every relationship that he had, he had to be lying. Every relationship he had, he had to be telling people untruths. He had to be betraying their trust in order to maintain the secret world that he had. On the surface, Dennis Rader did seem like a regular guy. Cops believe Rader's wife of 33 years had no idea her husband led two lives. Neither did their kids. Oh, I don't think she knew. I don't think she knew. I don't think the children had a clue. I mean, you know, we all, you know, uh, I mean, uh, to, to think for a second that you were married to a serial murderer or your uh, father was a serial murderer, I mean, this, this doesn't even enter in. I mean, you know, uh, your father may be a lot of things, but a serial murderer, no way. Gary Van Dusen lived across the street from the Raider family. It's always been a real quiet community, and Dennis was the first one that welcomed me when I moved in personally. Now, the funny thing is, he never talked to my wife. In, in about 14 months, he never even said as much as hi to my wife. But he always, always talked to me. There, I did make the comment one time, I moved to Park City to get away from the crime, and he said, yes, it's bad out there. He had a normal childhood from all accounts that we know of in Wichita. He graduated with a criminal justice degree from Wichita State University. He had a stint in the military. Uh, and he held a number of jobs. He was apparently a kind of a guy who liked to control things in many ways. He, his last job was that of a compliance officer for the city of Park City, Kansas. Many remember Raider as being uptight, someone who took his job of enforcing Park City bylaws a little too seriously. People reported that he, in one instance, for example, 
He walked into a woman's home and said, don't forget tomorrow you have to appear in court. He walked in her living room without knocking, just opened the door and walked in. I have heard that, you know, from people that I know here in Park City that he would go out and measure the grass with a yardstick. If it got so high, he'd write him a citation. At his arraignment on May 3rd, Grader was asked to enter a plea. He refused. The judge entered a plea of not guilty on his behalf. Then on June 27th, 2005, Dennis Rader returned to court and changed that plea. How do you plead to these 10 counts? Guilty. Are, are you pleading guilty because you are guilty? Yes, sir. Up next, we go to Oakland County, Michigan, where the FBI is investigating a series of murders involving the worst kind of predator. The people look upon children as being absolutely innocent. They look upon the people who kill them or prey upon them as absolutely evil. And later on, THS investigates inside the mind of a serial killer. Among his uh, collection of, of items um, was a book on how to be a serial killer. In June 2005, Dennis Rader confessed to being the BTK Strangler. The sensational story made national headlines, but the news hit hardest here, in a wealthy suburb north of Detroit. Three decades earlier, someone kidnapped and murdered four kids, and the killer is still on the loose. When you talk about the BTK killer, and the fact that three decades went by, and they were able to crack that case. There is hope in many minds that this one will be cracked too. Flashback to February 1976, when the killings began in Michigan. The first victim that was abducted was Mark Stebbins. He was at the American Legion Hall near Nine Mile in Ferndale. He left in the early afternoon to go back home to watch a movie. He spoke to his mother on the phone. Everything was fine and uh, never never made it home. Uh, at 11 o'clock that night, his mother filed a missing person report. He disappeared for several days and then his body was found. He was fully clothed, uh, had his uh, jacket on, his hood was on. His cause of death was actually a strangulation. He was strangled. The autopsy showed he was sexually assaulted. Violent crimes, especially those involving kids, were not supposed to happen in places like this. Now this is a suburban county to the city of Detroit. Uh, it's very affluent, the third wealthiest county in America. It's a pretty peaceful county, and so as, as prosecutor, and it wasn't filing murder charges every week like you, some maybe urban prosecutors might be facing. It's a safe community. Birmingham and the other communities are the type of communities that people felt comfortable with their kids going out to the parks, out to playgrounds, walking to school. If it could happen here, people thought it could happen anywhere and nobody is really safe. You're supposed to have kids that can play in the yard and can go to the store down the street and can be outside without having somebody watch them. And we weren't able to do that here. And I think that's what really frightened people. I'm shocked and uh, terrified. It's a terrible way to live, I think. I, I'm very saddened because children just you're afraid to let them have any freedom anymore and most of all i'm upset because my children are very frightened and i don't want to be outside alone anymore and won't come to school alone and i think that's the worst thing to grow up being uh, distrusting people kept their kids at home uh, parents walked with them uh, to stores uh, to neighbors houses uh, they did not want to leave their kids alone Despite precautions, 10 months after Mark Stebbins' murder, Jill Robinson disappeared. Like Mark, Jill was only 12. Jill was taken approximately uh, 7.30 p.m. on a Wednesday, December 22nd. She was at the Tiny Tim Hobby Center, located on Woodward Avenue in Royal Oak. Four days later, hope turned to grief. She was found laying in the snow along I-75 in the city of Troy brutally murdered with a shotgun blast to the face. Police theorized that perhaps uh, she was trying to get away. Well, we don't have any information as to who did it at all. We haven't been able to come up uh, with any leads, uh, 
as to her whereabouts, even for one minute of the time uh, when she was gone from her home. Every child in this county, certainly after the first two went missing, uh, every parent instructed their children what to do, what to say, nay, nay, run away, and all the things we teach our kids to, to avoid strangers. But even the smartest and toughest kids are no match for a predator. Two weeks after Jill's body was discovered, the killer struck again. The third one was Christina Mihalik. Uh, at approximately uh, 3 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon, January 2nd, she left her home in the city of Berkeley to walk down to the 7-Eleven store. I believe it was to grab a fashion magazine. Mom knew about it, off she went, and uh, never returned. 18 days later, the body of 10-year-old Christine was found on a rural road in an area known as Franklin Village. She was fully clothed and had been smothered to death. By late January 1977, the investigation included hundreds of local cops, state troopers, and FBI agents. There were few good clues and no suspects. But all three murders did have one thing in common. Certainly there's uh, evidence that she was uh, kept clean during that time. Uh, uh, the medical examiner said her body was exceptionally clean. The perpetrator or perpetrators clean the bodies not because they were some clean freak they just it'd be, get rid of evidence fingernails were scraped if you were to scratch somebody you had that person's tissue under your nails they were scraped the bodies were cleaned and also we have uh, the, the commonalities that these youngsters were well fed and they were all taken care of um, other than that they were murdered at the end of the, their stay children were you know obviously uh, duped into some sort of a situation, whether he was disguised as a policeman, disguised as a priest. He gained the confidence of these kids. But these kids weren't killed instantly. They were held a couple of days. So we had to decide, well, where, where did he have that kind of access to, uh, to to imprison these children? He has the capacity to store or keep his victims for a number of days without being detected. It can be anyone, and I think we all think, and I've said this in many of the press conferences, that it's some dirty old man handing candy to a child. That's not the case in this instance. This person is a trusted individual. It could be a public official. It could be a people of the clergy. It could be a doctor. It could even be police people. Pressure to catch the killer intensified. The evidence suggested the same person committed all three crimes. We're doing a number of things that we can't release right at this time. I still feel the most important aspect is the investigation and get this animal off the street. Well, sir, killing in itself is traumatic on any community. But a child serial killer, certainly uh, the more vulnerable the victim, what really uh, touches society in, in a strong way. The defenseless child who can't uh, understand the nature of the danger they may be in, uh, can't protect themselves. In my history as a newspaper reporter, the only killings I've ever seen that I thought might inspire a lynch mob or something like it in the, the murders of children. The people look upon children as being absolutely innocent. They look upon the people who kill them or prey upon them as absolutely evil. Um, and there just is no um, either pity or excuse for killing a child. In March 1977, panic turned to near hysteria. A fourth child was abducted from a supermarket parking lot. Authorities knew there wasn't much time. 11-year-old Timmy King had only days to live. We pushed the limits of uh, the Constitution when it came to search and seizure. In February 2005, cops and FBI agents in Oakland County, Michigan, poured over police reports and thousands of tips, trying to solve a 30-year-old murder mystery. Tracking any cold case is a challenge, and this one took investigators back to the mid-70s when three kids were abducted and brutally murdered over the span of just a year. By March 1977, a fourth child was missing. Approximately 8.30 p.m. Wednesday, March 16th, Timothy King left his home in Birmingham to walk to a store. Timmy's father, Barry King, has never spoken publicly about that terrible day. 
when Timmy was snatched, uh, he was in his sixth grade. He had a brother in the ninth grade, a brother in the tenth grade, and my daughter in the twelfth grade. They were all able to walk to school. His father was an attorney, and he was leaving his house just to walk up to the neighborhood drugstore, about uh, probably two and a half blocks. Timmy had been warned repeatedly about going with strangers. But I do remember telling Tim if anybody approached him to drop everything he had and run and scream. It was good advice, but Timmy probably didn't get the chance to run, and the clock was ticking. The killer's first three victims were snatched off the street and held for several days. Then, they were murdered. The Oakland County Prosecutor, Al Brooks Patterson, typed up a letter. They brought in police from all over the state, so they had hundreds of them in, in Oakland County, and they literally stopped every car on the road that was out there after 1 a.m. in the morning. And they read this letter which said, we want to look in your trunk for Timmy King. If we find anything else, you can just go away, you can just keep going. But we won't hold that against you. But we're looking for Timmy King. It's just part of the investigation. We're checking the cars that are going through to see who's in the area. We pushed the limits of uh, the Constitution when it came to search and seizure. We were stopping cars. We were taking liberties that I think everybody understood why we were. Uh, they knew that we were uh, trying to find, hopefully, Timmy alive. And uh, we might have had people open their trunks without probable cause, but citizens who had nothing to fear were more than willing to do so. Um, and I make no apologies for that. They opened dozens and dozens of trunks that night. Not one single person objected, but they did not find Timmy King. We were advised uh, that if it was the same perpetrator, that there was a time period involved. As a lawyer, I know that some of the stuff they did is probably unconstitutional, but you want your kid back. We very much want Tim to come home. We love him very much, uh, wherever he is and whoever he is with. We want him back home. He's got a basketball game on Saturday, and uh, wherever you are, Tim, we love you. We want you back home. The grief-stricken family appealed to a local newspaper for help. Timmy King's mother had given the Detroit News a letter to publish. We published it across the front page of the Sunday newspaper, and it was a plea to the kidnapper to return her son. She described Timmy, what a great student he was, uh, an athlete, and they said if, if he were home today, he'd be having his favorite meal of Kentucky Fried Chicken. But as hours turned to days, hope faded. On day six, the frantic search ended. These two young fellas uh, came a pounding on the door and said that there's a dead boy in the ditch. And they were all shook up, and then I began to get shook up. Let's put it this way, I called the police right away. It was that night, and the body was still warm enough that they brought paramedics who tried to revive him at the scene, but they never could. Timmy was sexually assaulted, but he was fully clothed, very clean. When they did the autopsy on his body, his last meal was Kentucky Fried Chicken. The news of Timmy's murder stunned a community already reeling from the loss of three other kids. The task force redoubled efforts to find the killer. There's approximately nine agencies that have been involved with the Oakland County child killing case. During the task force days, we had approximately 300 officers assigned to the investigation. We received tens of thousands of tips and thousands and thousands of names. The public was great. I mean, they were truly trying to help. The amount of money and the amount of time and the amount of people who worked on finding Tim is just amazing, and I have uh, nothing but admiration for the people who participated in that. Police followed up on hundreds of leads, but the killer was never caught. The following up on tips is, is just a terribly monotonous job as far as the officers are concerned. Right now, you don't have anything really to charge for on this? No. Not one of those cliches that will make an arrest in 24 hours or anything like that. The task force days, of course, stopped. The investigation wasn't solved, but it wasn't forgotten. Nearly 30 years passed. Then came the BTK arrest in Wichita. That turned the heat back on the Michigan case. That gave us some new light. It gave us some, uh, some more publicity. My recent 
activation of the case, we've had about 250 new tips come in. It was during the same time period in the late 70s. BTK went unsolved. However, the difference between that case and the Oakland County child killing case is that the BTK killer taunted the police, let us know that he was still out there. This is a cold case. Hopefully it can be solved. I, I, I firmly believe it can be, but I have a responsibility. I, I, I have to give these families some closure to, to some extent. We have tens of thousands of files in this particular file cabinet were tips number 17,200 to 17,224. This, this room, uh, we have composite drawings on the wall of some of the characteristics as one of the suspect composites that we put various appearances, glasses. Sergeant Gray works closely with FBI agents and Detective Sergeant David Robertson. For Robertson, the case hits especially close to home. My father was uh, assistant district commander in charge of the detective bureau for the state police. And I saw a lot of notes in familiar handwriting, which was my father's handwriting. So it was, it was interesting to see a lot of this uh, information and things that I know my father had looked through. I think it would be wonderful if we could say we solved this case. And uh, I think my father would just be ecstatic to know that the case was finally solved. I can tell you that every time I pass by one of the spots where one of those young children was found dead, Christine Mihalich on Bruce Lane, I look at that spot and I remember standing there and covering the story and how I felt back then. And I never take my eyes off that one spot and it's still there. There's a lot of growth around, there's life around, there's a subdivision around, it's been over two decades, but that one spot still in my eyes remains there untouched and I can, I can visualize those stories. We were affected by it. Everybody was affected by it, including the police officers. He was interested in everything. He uh, was an all-star and he was a sweet kid. I would like to know who did this to Tim before I die. But justice isn't the only thing on the line in Oakland County. There may be more that uh, than we initially thought in our original task force days. There were several other children during that time period that were abducted. It's a terrifying thought. A monster who preys on children still on the loose after 30 years. Up next, a look at two of the most notorious serial killers of all time. Maybe they hold a clue to solving the Michigan murders. I spent over 600 on Gacy. I saw him on death row. I was there the night he was executed, and I helped assist in his autopsy. And still to come, never before televised, Jeffrey Dahmer. Why you actually took the lives of your victims? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to know the reason for that, too. in Kansas and Michigan are grim reminders that serial killers can strike any time, any place. Yet for many people, there's a strange fascination attached to these outcasts. That was certainly true with Ed Gein, an unassuming Wisconsin farmer who turned out to be the original psycho. Ed Gein is the superstar of serial killers in a way because he actually wore their skin and ate their flesh and stuff like that. It's insane. You murder somebody and you wear their skin? It's nuts. That's, uh, you eat their flesh, you cannibalize them? Hey, it doesn't get crazier than that. Or, or it's beyond being human. Ed Gein's father died in 1945. Five years later, Gein's mother passed away. Ed boarded up her room and preserved it as a shrine. And he's a nice man, just like anybody else. The only difference I'd say in the man, he seems to be a little odd. Odd, odd, yeah. He's sort of the poster child. If, if there is any such a thing as a typical sort of background or history, uh, Ed Gein has it with the abusive childhood and a very domineering uh, maternal figure in his life. Gein soon started digging up fresh graves. 
He skinned the corpses to make clothing and household articles. Around the same time, police in Wisconsin began looking into a series of missing person cases. Investigators later found the remains of 15 women in and around Gein's farmhouse. Oh, God! Mother! Blood! Blood! Gein's story inspired the horror what? classic Psycho. The film, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, starred Janet Lee and Anthony Perkins. inspired other films, including The Silence of the Lambs and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And Aiken was really the first serial murderer that had nationwide attention. The fascination of what these people do to human beings is something even life can't describe. You know, these are the people that do things that in our imagination we can't possibly think about doing. In 2001, actor Steve Railsback played the serial killer in yet another movie titled simply Ed Gein. I'm gonna do it. And she's not going to stop me. He had a terrible childhood. His mother hated women. And so he grew up being constantly being told that women were evil, that women were the devil's work. And he was a simple farm person. And his reason for doing all this was his mama told him to. Mama told me. I don't want no whore. Mom always said that if a woman's good enough for any course, she's good enough for marriage. Did I ever tell you you remind me of her? I do. Ed Gein eventually confessed to two murders, the shooting deaths of Mary Hogan and Bernice Warden. Both women were in their 50s, about the same age as Gein's mother when she died. Police were unable to pin any other murders on Gein. In 1958, a judge found Gein legally insane and committed him to a mental hospital in Wisconsin. A decade later, psychiatrists said Gein was fit to stand trial. Robert Sutton prosecuted the case, one he'll never forget. My first cross-examination of him, I took the photographs of Mrs. Warden, which are the most ghoulish things you can imagine. And he took them one at a time. I said, like, you'd look at these pictures, Mr. Gein. So he looked at them, and it was like a normal person would look at some exotically beautiful thing, and he couldn't put them down. And, you know, there were reporters from all over the world in the courtroom, and you could have heard a pin drop. Nobody said, and it must have taken him 20 minutes to go through all of the nine photographs. And then, Puts him down. I said, you recognize that? He said, I don't remember. It was, it was like a movie. It was scripted. He was just, he was a weird, weird man. A lot of people just thought he was sort of this, this harmless old man who lived out in the woods, uh, which he wasn't. And I think that, that uh, another part of it that bothers people or that really worries them is that this could be somebody living next door to them. I had never tried a case of that magnitude, but no one had. It was probably the equivalent to the, the Lindbergh kidnapping. How many did he kill? I would say between six and ten, but he robbed so many graves. He would keep the skulls and the, the, the different artifacts, human skin, in the house. It was impossible to determine with precision how many people he had killed and how many graves he had robbed. Gein was found not guilty by reason of insanity and sent back to the mental hospital. He died there in 1984 of cancer. If Ed Gein was the most psychotic serial killer, John Wayne Gacy was one of the most prolific. 
Between 1972 and 1978, the building contractor and divorced father of two raped, tortured, and murdered at least 33 teenage boys in the Chicago area. Like Gein, Gacy created a shop of horrors inside his own home. After Gacy was arrested in 1978, investigators dug up 31 bodies, most of them buried in a crawl space under his suburban house. Two other bodies were found in a nearby river. John Wayne Gacy didn't capture our imagination because he was so gruesome. He captured our imagination because he was so, quote, apparently normal, end quote, and doing all these strange things. In fact, many neighbors thought of Gacy as an all-around nice guy who liked to help kids. John Wayne Gacy is a, 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 an example of another guy who's kind of at the high end of the social competence, um, uh, and married and has a business and is involved in politics. Yet at the same time, he was raping and murdering uh, boys and involved in necrophilia and, and all of these things. In 1980, Gacy was convicted of all 33 murders, the most in U.S. history. Make no excuse, give Gacy the juice. 14 years later, Gacy died by lethal injection in Illinois' Statesville Correctional Center. He was 52. I was there the night he was executed and I helped assist in his autopsy. When you ask a serial murderer why they kill, they look at you as if, why are you asking me that question? Why, why, why? I mean, I just killed them. Coming up on THS Investigates, a chilling encounter with a serial killer never before seen on TV. The other procedure that you utilized was to drill holes through the bone, through the skull here. Yeah. My next question is why you actually took the lives of your victims? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to know the reason for that too. I don't know. They called him the Milwaukee Cannibal, and for good reason. Jeffrey Dahmer took sadistic pleasure in torturing, then eating his victims. I uh, injected another syringe full of that uh, dilute hydrochloric acid, and that's what uh, killed him. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to kill him, but. That's, that's when FBI profilers talk about the classic serial killer, they look here to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where Jeffrey Dahmer went on a killing spree that lasted more than 10 years. Dahmer was raised in a middle-class family in Milwaukee, but his dad worked most of the time, and his mother often suffered from depression. Unfortunately, the couple argued a lot. As a young boy growing up in the 60s, Jeffrey retreated into his own world. Dahmer made a game of killing small animals, skinning them, and then cleaning the meat off their bones with acid. That's the sort of thing that uh, uh, should raise a flag of concern uh, when, when we have that sort of behavior, uh, or prolonged torturing of any animal, uh, enjoying that. That's the sadistic element that is of, uh, is of concern, because you're only a step away. Animals can show fear, they can cry, they can scream. Dahmer began to drink heavily as a teenager. He became moody, withdrawn, and antisocial. Soon after his parents split in 1978, Dahmer struck for the first time. He picked up a 19-year-old hitchhiker, had sex with him, and then crushed his skull with a crowbar. Dahmer dragged the body into a crawl space, dismembered it, and stored the pieces in plastic bags. Some of it had to do with loneliness. He didn't want these people to leave, so uh, he kill, killed them to, to keep them around. I think that was uh, sort of uh, unique, perhaps, to Dahmer. Dahmer then began cruising gay bars in Milwaukee and Chicago, hunting for victims. All were young males. Most were black. Somehow the violence and sexuality got paired. Violence itself becomes eroticized, and that becomes the, the exciting part of it. Dahmer later talked candidly about his methods in a deposition conducted by attorney Robert Slattery. The tape has never before aired on television. He would make offers to lure young men by offering them money. Sometimes, yes. And what you'd offer the money for is for the taking of pictures. 
on occasion. You'd also offer them drinks. Mm. Your answer is yes. Or, and you didn't necessarily propose a sexual encounter, but you hoped that it would lead in that direction. Right. The other procedure that you utilized was to drill holes through the bone, through the skull area. Yes. What did you inject into the hole? Uh, sometimes hot water, sometimes a weak acid solution. What sort of acid? Hydrochloric. Now, what was the purpose of that drilling technique now? To uh, put the person in a sort of zombie-like state. I didn't know exactly what I would do, but I was uh, experimenting for a What do you mean when you say a zombie-like state? What do you say to or he would uh, be willing to uh, just follow my orders and uh, not want to leave. Dahmer's killing spree lasted 13 years. It finally ended in July 1992, where it started in Milwaukee. Dahmer had his next victim handcuffed in his apartment, but the 32-year-old man escaped. He led cops back to Dahmer's. There, they found the remains of 13 bodies, including human heads stuffed in the refrigerator. He would murder him and uh, decompose him, he cannibalized him. There were photos of some of the most ghastly things that you could ever imagine happening to a human being that Dimer did to his victims. Attorney Thomas Jacobson represented the families of 11 victims. I'll never get a chance to tell him that I loved him. I'd have a chance to tell him that I loved him the last time I saw him. You took my daughter's only brother away from her. I hope you can deal with what you've done. Jeff, why are you? I hate you! That's not the truth! Don't fuck with you, I'm not killing you! February 1992, 31-year-old Jeffrey Dahmer was convicted of 15 murders. By then, a mad scramble to exploit the bizarre story was already in high gear. Everybody was trying to do a Dahmer thing, you know, it was sick, disgusting, exploited for money. Book writers, movie makers, it's okay for them to make money, but God forbid that the families of the victims should get anything for what happened to them. Jacobson filed a civil suit against Dahmer. The judge awarded the families a total of $120 million for their pain and suffering. But where would the money come from? Dahmer certainly didn't have that kind of cash. We had actually, in L.A., arranged with some writers, and how we were going to do it was that Jeffrey Dahmer would be interviewed face-to-face -face and filmed. And basically, for his first-person story rights, you know, Jeffrey, how did you get to be such a sick individual that did so many demented, disgusting things with your victims? You know, that story was worth a million dollars. Dahmer refused to talk. Jacobson then came up with another idea. This one was hard to believe. We knew that the 311 items that were confiscated by the police from Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment, which included the vat that he used to boil down his victims, the hypodermic needle he used to lobotomize his victims, the cutting utensils he used to cut up his victims, uh, the acids he used, and uh, the lava lamp, uh, everything else that was in that apartment would have a value. The same judge ruled that the victim's family had the right to seize Dahmer's personal property. So that was our plan. We were going to have a Jeffrey Dahmer auction and sell off to the highest bidder all of Jeffrey Dahmer's assets. Even more disturbing, TV stations around the world lined up for exclusive rights to broadcast the auction. But the idea appalled most people, especially in Milwaukee. What ultimately happened there was that Joe Zilber, who is a philanthropist, wealthy, wealthy property owner in Milwaukee did not want to see something like that happen. He did not want a Jeffrey Dahmer auction. He thought it would be terrible for the world, terrible for Milwaukee. He stepped up and ended up through negotiations, paid us $430,000, which then was divided up amongst all of the victim families. My fee, of course, I gave to charity, and that's how that ended. Except the creepy sideshow wasn't over. Not until Joe Zober took Dahmer's possessions and had them destroyed. Jeffrey Dahmer died in prison. 
he was beaten to death by a fellow inmate. Profilers agree Dahmer fit the profile of most serial killers, white, male, and under 35. Eileen Warnos broke that mold, at least on the outside. Yet inside, the woman who became known as the highway hooker and damsel of death was just like the men. There is a common link in these mystery murders. All eight were white, middle-aged men. They had all been robbed, their vehicles stolen and abandoned, and they had been shot with a small caliber gun and their bodies dumped in rural areas similar to this one. Black widows, they murder their husbands for the money or what have you. Uh, nursing home murders, uh, you've got angels of mercy killings in hospitals. Uh, but she, to the best of my knowledge, was the only serial sexual killer who was a female. And that makes her very interesting. Like Dahmer, Eileen Wuornos also came from a dysfunctional family. Her father, Leo Wuornos, went to prison for raping a young girl. He later hanged himself in his cell. When Eileen was only four, her mom, Diane, took off, leaving her with relatives. Eileen Wuornos had a very disturbed childhood. She had severe mental illness. She also had a motive of rage and revenge against the people that she felt had destroyed her as a young child. At 14, Eileen became pregnant. She hid her pregnancy for six months. Finally, after six months, she had to disclose her pregnancy at which time she was immediately sent to a home for unwed mothers. She gave the baby up for adoption and then hit the road. She wound up uh, being a prostitute, in which prostitutes are almost by definition abused by the men around them. So after uh, this long period of abuse, uh, she starts killing people. I saw him coming toward me, and it's... I was going to turn to look at him, and before I even got a chance to turn to look at him, he whipped a cord around my neck. He said, you're going to do everything I tell you to do, and if you don't, I'll kill you right now. Eileen killed the man, and then she killed again. All her victims were paying customers. She apparently gets some kind of a, a, a sexual thrill out of, out of the actual killing of these guys. Um, so then, and, and I, I think that the, what this is, is, is a kind of just a, such a reversal of roles. In 1989 and 1990, Wuornos shot and killed six men in Florida. Police tracked down and arrested Wuornos in January 1991. Wuornos confessed to all six murders. In 1993, she got the death penalty. Nine years later, Wuornos was executed by lethal injection in a Florida state prison. She was 46. Along the way, there were books and TV movies. Then, in 2003, the Eileen Wuornos story hit the big screen. Monsters scored with both critics and audiences. She wasn't glamorized in that movie. She was pretty well portrayed as just pathetic. Charlize Theron won the Oscar for her riveting portrayal of Warnos. She was a flawed human like all of us and I'm a true believer that you know we all make certain choices in our life and she made some really bad choices in her life but she also came from a very unfortunate place. Even as children it seems Eileen Warnos and Jeffrey Dahmer never really had a chance. They were damaged goods right from the start. But lots of kids come from messed up families, and most of them turn out okay. So at what point did everything go haywire? Coming up on THS Investigates, there may be a genetic predisposition to violence, and then in an abusive environment, then we're almost guaranteed to create a monster. The most unimaginable crime. But the question still remains, why do they kill? Most of them are killing for power or out of rage. They want to have control. Yes, there probably is a sexual element, 
but that element is part of having absolute control over somebody else. There's something missing there that, that, that this lack of compassion and empathy and concern for others is, they're very devoid of this. Many serial killers enjoy killing. I think it was Ted Bundy who said that when he was strangling a victim or killing a victim, and he saw the, the life go out of the eyes, that that was, that was the greatest moment. He felt like God. They're completely disconnected from humanity in general. And that's very difficult for people to understand because as human beings, we look at people and say, how could you possibly do something like that? How could you make that person suffer? How could you eat them? How could you dismember them? But to the serial murderer, there's absolutely nothing of any meaning to the act that they do. Michael Rooker played the lead role in Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer, the 1986 film based on the life of Henry Lee Lucas. Lucas was caught in 1983 and convicted of two murders. He confessed to hundreds more. I would think being a serial killer, you can't really tell your best friend, yeah, 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 I'm a serial killer. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah, no, it's, it's like, it's, you're completely closed off. If you have another life, and, and usually they do, you know, you, it's all compartmentalized. I killed my mama one night. It was my 14th birthday. And she was drunk. And we had an argument. She hit me with a whiskey bottle. You know, there's one little section someplace in your brain where that worm is still squirming, yeah? And, but you look normal, you act normal, you have a wife and children, you have, you know, you walk your dog every day, you have a regular job, which, of course, makes it even more frightening and horrifying, yeah? There's an ability to kill in the most ordinary people. Sometimes it goes back to the idea that, that we're sort of flipping back into the Stone Age, that this is the old killer instinct that is buried in the human soul as a kind of survival mechanism that propels us to kill, or at least allows us to kill. The debate rages on. Are serial killers a product of their environment, or are they born to kill? There may be a genetic predisposition to violence, and then if somebody has that, uh, and they're brought up in an abusive environment, then we're almost guaranteed to create a monster. But we also know that a lot of people have been brought up in abusive environments, and they do not become serial killers and serial rapists and or violent offenders. So it isn't just nature alone, it isn't just nurture alone, it's quite often some not well understood nature-nurture tangle to create uh, violent offenders. Something goes wrong in prenatal life. This is not passed down in families. This is not something that occurs in generations. It's not like inheriting, you know, the blue eyes from your family. This is something that doesn't express itself until you're in your early teens, when brain chemistry, when brain hormones, and brain structure are all changing. Because this is the age at which the first murder occurs for the serial killer. The fact is, there is a whole spectrum of all these permutations of various things blending and becoming something a little different. So none of these people are any really one thing. So, this is a dagger. Earlier we talked about Patricia Cornwell's exhaustive effort to unmask the identity of Jack the Ripper. Cornwell used handwriting experts to compare the Ripper's letters to the writings and drawings of the man she believed committed the crimes. Her conclusion surprised a lot of people. Walter Richard Sickert was a very prominent British artist who lived in the Victorian era. He was a very eccentric, uh, sociopathic, very difficult but charming man, extremely handsome, spoke seven or eight languages. There's no question in my mind that he wrote a number of these Jack the Ripper letters. You can see on the light boxes, there, there's, there are five, for example, three Sickert letters and two Ripper letters that were written on the same batch of watermark paper of which there could have only been 24 sheets in existence like these five sheets. Now, that's not coincidence. Walter Sickert died in 1942. London police never linked him to the infamous case. The reason Jack the Ripper got away with these crimes is because he wasn't what anybody was looking for. The problem with the serial murderer is that they don't really have a personality. They don't have anything that you can diagnose. 
adopted. They are such chameleons that they become whatever their environment wants them to become. And they are tremendous actors. Police here in Wichita, Kansas have a true chameleon in custody. Dennis Rader, husband, father and devoted church leader, fooled everyone for more than 30 years. Among his uh, collection of, of items um, was a book on how to be a serial killer. He, in, in uh, being a serial killer, has also apparently studied serial killing and um, wanted to make himself fit the mold. And uh, he would have continued to kill. The long, scary ordeal may be over, but the memories still haunt the families of the victims, including Charlie Otero. Charlie was only 15 when his parents, a brother, and a sister were murdered by Dennis Rader. I relive their deaths, how I believe they died. The screaming, the tears, the fears, the terror. I feel their thoughts, I feel their, their pain. Dennis Rader will be sentenced on August 17, 2005. Rader will almost certainly spend the rest of his life behind bars. There was no death penalty in Kansas when Rader committed his crimes. That's it for this edition of THS Investigates. I'm Samantha Harris. Thanks for watching.